Hello, everybody. Um, so to pick up on that theme, we're going to talk about um, kind of like a startup company going to the U.S., so conquering the U.S. markets. Um, uh, as typical in the U.S., you have uh, different experts in different fields in the legal side. I'm a tax partner at Venable. Uh, I'm here with Jim Nelson, corporate, and Frank Asparo, uh, IP, and we will cover a few uh, salient issues, how to conquer the U.S. from a uh, approach to sell products and services into the U.S. as well as raise capital. Um, so how do we set this up? So let's kind of like let's just take a company. Frank, the president of Data Dragon GmbH, has a very successful business, and they are doing retail points of sale solution with a hardware component and a software component. Uh, Frank has managed to build a pretty successful startup team located in Munich here with 12 people and also secured some financing and funding through uh, state funding as well as some seed financing and early investors primarily located in Europe. So one of the things that we see often, Frank then goes about and sees that the US has a wonderful customer basis that is very eager and our early adopters of new technology. And he is also realizing that the 12 people he is employing still are pre-money and they don't really have the revenues, thus he needs to think about raising capital. Uh, and capital, again, kind of like it's raised more easily in the US many times than in Europe. So how do we go about this? Uh, what do you think about it? How do we you know, engage in that process? And so I'm going to hand it over to Jim, who talks about some of the corporate items. Thanks, Friedman. Thank you. Um, right, so we hear from clients all the time, and there's a, a lot of the questions actually are, when should we start talking to counsel? And from a US perspective, earlier is better. Formation of a company and going into the states is actually fairly straightforward, um, and better to ask the question and say, now's not the time, instead of don't ask the question. Typically, as we've kind of heard in the setup, you're going because you either want to find investors, you want to find customers, or you want to find employees in the US. Um, all of those lead to formation of an entity in most cases. So in the United States, uh, we have different states. You can have a, a state uh, formation. So you will hear a lot about Delaware C-Corps, which is the general answer for most people coming in for tax reasons we'll discuss. But um, you can register a company in any of the 50 states. It's typical that people go to Delaware. It's a very developed state when it comes to corporate law. It's predictable. Investors know what they're investing in with the Delaware C Corp. If for some reason you're not expecting to go to all 50 states or you're going to go to uh, one or two states, there could be conversations about just going to California, for example, where I'm out of the San Francisco office and say, let's do a California corporation and avoid the complication of other jurisdictions. But uh, it's a fairly straightforward exercise. Forming a company you can do within a day or two, um, starting the original paperwork, it's very efficient to do a C-Corp, which is why people do that uh, quite a bit of the time. Occasionally, you hear conversations about limited liability companies, which are partnerships, uh, for lack of a better description, and have a lot of flexibility. But the flexibility actually creates cost because uh, there's more questions to answer. That's where typically, particularly again, if you're looking for investors in the States, they're familiar with the Delaware C Corp. They know what it is. They go forward as opposed to a limited liability company. We can hit some of those points a bit more uh, as we go through. Um, so once you've got the entity formed, there's also a lot of questions about customer access. Many companies actually have sold a product or two or a service or two, like Frank would do where you know, I've got an opportunity to sell to someone in Ohio, so I'm just going to sell from uh, Germany into Ohio under a customer agreement that I've used in Germany to success on many occasions. Uh, it is important to consider whether there should be changes to the agreement. Sometimes customers don't want to sign up with a foreign entity from an Ohio perspective. They would want to uh, deal with uh, either a US entity or consider US choice of law or different things when it comes to disputes. So it's important from a customer acquisition basis that you'd have a conversation about, even if I don't form an entity, what should I do with my existing customer agreement? And then lastly, as a driver, it's often employees. So um, people may want to find uh, either 
uh, a lead position in, in uh, the United States, maybe it's engineering help, maybe it's uh, sales help, whatever it might be. In those cases, uh, you particularly, we're gonna hear a little more on a tax basis, but from a state by state basis, the United States has uh, fairly wide variations in employment law, particularly when you go into California, we have um, some unique uh, employment laws, particularly around non-competes and other things. So you may be familiar with it, but typically in California, it's quite difficult to uh, bar an employee from going to work for a competitor. Uh, you can protect your information, but you're not in a position to have uh, restricted covenants and things when a, a person would leave your company. New York and other states don't have as many restrictions, but do be mindful on a state-by-state -state basis, there are unique state requirements. Lastly, I would point out, and I've seen this quite a bit, people come from Europe and uh, have a broader expectation on vacations, things like that. We Americans don't take as many vacations uh, as we should. <laughs> so we end up in a situation where oftentimes the employment package for someone coming over is actually more uh, beneficial to someone in the United States, the States than they might otherwise expect. And in those cases, it's fine if you're starting down that road, but you want to be mindful also that once you've kind of set that ball in motion, everyone's going to expect the same treatment. So uh, if you're going to run it all off of kind of a more of a European or German employment uh, perspective and view, days off, uh, days for uh, uh, illness or other things, it, uh, it's something that would be best to go into the United States and harmonize and think about what should be done in the United States from the start rather than uh, just dropping into the United States, what you've already got going uh, within whatever European country you're, uh, you're, you're starting in. Thank you, Jim. Uh, so once you kind of like uh, thought about some of the corporate things, uh, I always say uh, tax actually drives most, most transactions. Tax often drives expansion into the in, in, into foreign uh, uh, countries. And so I think the first question that I always get from, from early stage investors, so can I sell my products or my services into the United States without actually creating an entity? And that the next question will be, well, am I gonna be subject to tax? Well, uh, if you don't have people in the US, if you don't have employees there, if you maybe just have some reseller agreements, uh, and you are selling tangible properties in the US, you actually don't need to uh, form an entity. You can sell it, f at least from a tax perspective, you can just sell it straight from Germany or European countries into the US, and there shouldn't be really any tax consequences to the company. Uh, there's often a perception, as Jim mentioned, about you know it's better to sell locally than through, through uh, uh, a non-US company. Uh, what happens if you have um, service income, SaaS income, or royalty income? Well, it's a little bit slightly different because then now you need to think about withholding taxes. So if you, if you, if you license your products into the United States and the customer is going to pay you a license fee, there's usually a 30% withholding tax. So you need to figure out how you can reduce that and so you can maybe rely on tax treaties. If you can't rely on tax treaties, maybe, again, it might make sense to set up a, a company um, uh, in the United States. Sometimes also a company helps you to isolate the IRS's reach into, into your uh, domestic company and they love to do that. Uh, they have a long arm where they really reach into other jurisdictions to collect uh, revenues. Um, in terms of actually US, and that's pretty new, uh, it's actually now also an opportunity to actually reduce your tax burdens overall. I mean, Germany has a, you know, a corporate tax rate in the mid-20s. The United States just dropped their tax rate to about 21%, and then they have actually special regimes which might help you to reduce the tax rates down to around 13%. Um, and then one more word about kind of like uh, the investor angle. When you raise capital in the US, I mean, it's very typical that your investor will uh, or ask you, or protective investors will ask you to set up a C Corp in the US as a holding company and drop your, your operating company that you used to have in Germany underneath it. And, get, and then get your early investor, they need to roll over their equity into the US holding company. And so there are some considerations whether or not you can actually do this on a tax-free basis or you're gonna recognize some gain. And in my experience, the way to really approach this topic is sooner than later, when your valuation is still reasonably low, 
uh, you have a much better argument to actually either get rollover relief that is taxable, but there's actually no taxable gain, or have a, a complicated structure in order to minimize the tax burden. But that last point is something that I can't stress enough. Uh, if you want to raise capital in the US, think about your early investors, how it's going to affect them. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Frank, and he's going to talk to us about uh, IP. Thank you, Friedemann. Um, what Frank should consider doing um, before he enters the US market is developing an IP strategy. Um, there's two aspects to that. Um, first is how can Frank protect his technology and branding in the US? Likely a very similar analysis that he underwent in Europe and elsewhere. Um, the second aspect is how does Frank um, mitigate the risk of being uh, sued for patent infringement or some other type of um, IP um, infringement. There are, um, like, like in Europe, uh, there are various um, IP options, IP protection options, um, patents and trademarks and copyrights. Um, IP is territorial in the US, so without, um, without either registrations or unregistered um, IP, you don't have protection. Um, I think, you know, my understanding from uh, European IP lawyers is that it's still quite difficult to protect software. Um, Frank is fortunate that in the U.S. Um, it is, it's easier to protect software um, using the patent system. Um, patents are, they don't have to be expensive. Um, there, are, there are ways of getting um, patents um, on the functionality um, of an invention um, pretty quickly. Um, and there's a couple of strategic ways you can do it without spending a lot of money. Um, uh, Frank also may have design patent protection um, options as well, which is often overlooked. Um, it's super quick, relatively inexpensive, um, and a very powerful uh, mechanism for him to uh, keep competition out of the space when it comes to the aesthetics um, of his product. Trademarks very similar to Europe. Um, copyrights to the extent Frank has anything artistic about um, his products uh, or services, whether they're in print, um, they're an app, um, digital media, whatever it may be. Copyrights, easy, quick, relatively inexpensive to get. Um, one of the things I think that is often, um, it's a misconception, is uh, Frank has IP protection in the US, so that means Frank could practice his technology in the US, no one will bother him. Well, that's not the case. Um, just because you have IP protection doesn't mean you can actually use your technology um, without encroaching on other people's rights. So what we often recommend and what Frank should do is to do a search and figure out, are there people that have similar, uh, or have patents or, or trademarks um, that cover similar technology uh, or branding so that if it's early, or, early enough, um, possibly in the development stage, um, of one of Frank's innovations. If something is found, Frank will have the ability of tweaking it so that he mit mitigates the risk of encroaching on those people's IP rights. Um, I think with that, I think I'm gonna, I think with time is a bit of an issue, so if anyone has any questions on IP, I can easily answer that. Awesome, thank you, Frank. We'll cover the bases. So um, before we go delve uh, deeper into uh, various topics, uh, why don't we open it up for questions and then we see where we go. Awesome, thank you so much. I'm curious to see what came in. I can't I tell you guys, tax, discussing tax issues is so hard to uh, explain in an entertaining way. So let's see how we can do this. Um, can we see the questions that came in? Or did no question come in? Okay, as long as I can't see anything. Okay, let we two or we, th we four will we'll move on. Oh, here they are. Um, obviously, it's a legal question. It takes more than one line. As legal deals for US comes common in case of legal incompliance, out of, our ex out of your experience, is there a higher risk of foreign Comps or US base A solution. Yeah, okay, I know where this is going. Is there is there an easily framed answer to this? It's a difficult question. 
I'm not quite, so is this is the entity compliance or is this a question as to That's uh, what I, th I would expect. Yeah, I, th yeah. I think the question, if I, if I may try to yeah, rephrase sure. the question, I think it, is there a re higher compliance risk for a non-US company doing business in the United States than a US company yeah. doing business in the United States. I, I think that's the, that's the I question. I would expect that too. Yeah. Um, so I, let, me, let me answer it from a tax perspective and there are some, some, some corporate uh, concerns as well. Uh, he, here's, in terms of tax filings, there's no difference between a US company filing uh, returns and uh, their reports uh, as to a non-US company. So that's exactly the same. But there's one substantial difference. Uh, and this is kind of like what I mentioned before, this, this whole concept about an ar a, a long arm concept where the IRS might reach into revenues and profits from a non-US company that is doing business in the United States. So if you sell products and you have revenues in the US, that revenue and those, product and those profits are obviously taxable in the United States. But there is a fine line and there's a question of fact whether revenues that are maybe touching the US should be subject to tax in the IRS and they usually take an overbroad approach. So if that's a concern, I would say, recommend to set up a separate standalone entity. So the standalone entity to, oh, to understand that, is, uh, does that have the question of where do I need to tax my profits, right? Correct. Um, is super important when you have a company that is, that is um, developing one product, maybe on a, on a uh, European-based lab, and then selling, it, it's sold in the US, and then um, the U.S. entity would still go back to your European hub and say, okay, the, the money that you're making with your products on the European ground is, has to be taxed as well in the U.S.? Very, That's what very, happens? Very good question, Miriam. So let me kind of walk you through to that, what, what yeah. usually has to happen. So uh, if you want to sell in the U.S. because you're worried about the IRS or you say best, better customer approach through a local entity, but you have your R&D team in Germany or in Europe, how do you go about this? Well, so you, because you're crossing the border, you have to treat your US company as a completely independent company to your parent company in Europe. And so you have to literally sell or license your technology from your parent companies to your US companies. And then the US companies on sells, resells the product to your US based customers. There's a relationship then between your US company and your uh, foreign company, and you have to put in place a number of agreements. Mm. And one of the, the reasons why you have to put this in place is kind of like the whole concept about transfer pricing to give a fair price to each of the respective yeah, entities. Yeah, I get that. So, I mean, uh, an idea could be to price the license super high so that the US company would never make any profits or nothing to pay taxes on. Another, you know, there might be there might be different considerations we could have here. Uh, is there an approximate number how much that costs for a tech startup to set this up legally? Um, so setting up an entity, as Jim mentioned, very simple. Doesn't, yeah. No, doesn't, but that's no, not that's the hard not part. The, the hard part. That's the easy part. The easy part. The contracts uh, to make the it work. The contracts. If you want to set up some intercompany agreements, which you, which which is exactly what you're talking about. If you want to set up. Uh, maybe a reseller agreement uh, to, the, to the customer. And then when you, you, if you want to do a back of the envelope transfer pricing in order to understand whether where you can shift the, the yeah. profits, uh, you're looking, uh, so if you want to be best practice, it's a very expensive exercise and I would never recommend that uh, a startup to do, but you can do this for, for somewhere between 10 and $20,000. How many uh, hours have you guys worked am I getting for 20,000 back? <laughs> I'm just curious. Um, you're getting so much value out of oh, <laughs> this. Is, this is okay, good. Now we have some laugh in a, in a law discussion. It's good. So I um, would add maybe, just as to entity, yeah. just so we're clear too, because I think there can be a misperception. The entity formation in the US, you know, we're very simple on the need for, um, like any issues of being in the register, we don't have yeah. such things. It's really just getting registered with the state of Delaware, as I was saying earlier, in most cases, all states would be the same. The other thing too, when it comes to, can you have non-US folks involved in the corporate structure, it's pretty wide open. So I will say, and it ties a bit to the tax question, getting it started, pretty easy. Following corporate form, getting the right paperwork for the tax reasons and otherwise, important. Because if you just kind of create it and then disregard it, uh, you're gonna have the problem that you were trying to avoid in the first place. Exactly. 
Exactly. So, <laughs> what is your experience since uh, our good friend Mr. Trump is president? <laughs> is there a rise or decrease of foreign companies um, spreading to the U.S., especially from so Europe? So, who's Trump? Who? <laughs> who? <laughs> Trump who? Yeah, let's, let's not make it a political discussion, yeah. but from an from a, um, innovation point of view and, and how it affects the U.S. market. I mean, I would say, and kind of leading in on, and it is a bit of the Trump who. My sense is it's pretty much business as usual. I think there's a lot of noise. Um, I do, you know, businesses like predictability, therefore noise is unpredictable, and that makes me nervous. Mm. At, the end of the way, at the end of the day, most of the things, I mean, we have a tax law that changed, but otherwise we're in a position where things are usually substantially business as usual. I will say it's unfortunate, you can't deny it, that you know the tension or whatever you want to call it within the the discussions are things that you do hear a little bit about about people maybe having less appetite of of stain or particularly in silicon valley which is a huge um it's a huge environment for folks from all over the world uh and huge value from that that there's a little bit that you hear about but i actually th see in practice very little very little difference so if I can jump on this topic, just from your personal um, experience, um, there are reasons, I mean, there was an economist written a few weeks ago, and they said, okay, kind of the peak time of the valley is over because it's too expensive, and what it does to society in that area is actually, you can label it disgusting uh, yep. to some point. Um, so how do you experience that? I mean, you're still in the valley, right? Right, we're, our offices are actually there? in San Francisco, but we spend a lot of time Palo Alto and and okay. uh, Sunnyvale. So how do you experience that, that involvement? Is it actually moving over to LA or is the, is the energy still going in, in The energy is San still Francisco? very much in Silicon Valley and in San Francisco. There's a, actually a big migration. Kind of the first tech boom was much more in the valley. Now there's a lot more folks who are coming to San Francisco. Um, look, you put companies in many cases where the people are and where the people want to be and there's still a big draw. Uh, the, the human capital base is still substantially strong. So it's true, self-driving cars, you're here a little bit in Pittsburgh or Detroit or these mm -hmm. other places, but as the ecosystem in a startup environment, I used to practice in New York, I'd spent some time in Chicago, there's no, a, there's no city that comes close to replicating the kind of perpetual motion machine that's coming from ideas, human capital investors to kind of keep it going. No doubt, and we talk about it a ton and do a little bit, that the cost of living and the cost of operating the company going way high. So paying an engineer in Silicon Valley has got to be a lot more expensive than an engineer in Dayton, Ohio. Which comes, well, Ohio is not very tempting. Maybe, I'm sorry, <laughs> is anyone from Ohio? Um, so, um, yeah, which comes back to your comment earlier on when you said, well, when you set up your employee's contract, just be aware of what you're doing as you're trying to harmonize, maybe or maybe not, um, a company culture that one is potentially based in, in Germany and one is uh, based in the U.S. and they differ very much salary-wise um, and contract-wise. Related to that, too, and I'd say, and there is, you know, a, People can perceive a lot of cost, and there could be a lot of cost in things that are done, but it's easy to pick up the phone, have a conversation, at least get a lay of the land, and I guarantee that you won't receive a bill from us in the whole process. And asking the questions up front to think strategically. You may not have a bunch of dollars out of the gate, but you do want to be thinking, uh, gosh, I wish I didn't start the company here five years from now, now that I'm successful and I have a bunch of reorg that I need to do. So proactive conversation events like this, just have a dialogue, let me think it through. Maybe you do want to start out someplace different, um, but I think the opportunities are there and asking a few questions up front, whether you're going to go whole hog, best practices, or just kind of down and dirty, so to speak, to kind of get what you have to have, it's, uh, it's, it's a, it can be a relatively inexpensive entry. Uh, it's going to be more the cost of operating, hiring people and things like yeah, that. Yeah, absolutely. So. You certainly know Stripe Athletes. Would you recommend using the service for expanding or funding a digital company in the U.S.? I'm you familiar with know? Stripe, but Stripe what? Atlas. You guys know? <laughs> I don't. <laughs> so, <laughs> obviously, four people on stage Stripe. don't know what it is. I suppose, I suppose it must be a, a Q&A sort of help software. That's what I'm reading out of it. Is there any online solution that you can use, like the Wikipedia um, version of uh, first Q&As, answered easy questions so you don't have to pick up the phone and actually call a lawyer, which I might not be so friendly like you, your guys and not charge it? 
I will say in the startup world, there's a National Venture Capital Association, NVCA. A lot of people use their standard forms. Uh, there's some forums that are within that, and there's definitely a lot of people who blog and communicate startup community anything ideas. Anything you can recommend? Uh, well, the NVCA is, is okay. a website that's got good source of information. There's a blog, the startuplawyer.com. Okay. Um, other folks that are really in that environment. I will say this is the, your particular situation is unique. So it's one of those, you can go to LegalZoom, for example, and form your company. I see you, um, try, you are having a hard time to talk positively about your co online competitors, which is fine. <laughs> <laughs> That's totally well, fine. there's a certain amount of uh, quality Q&A, uh, real time, can uh, speed some things that may take you a while to digest online. So. It's all about relationship, isn't it? Employing my first two people in the US, forming a company, or using a payroll partner. Does so anyone of you guys know? It's also a little bit of a there financial are question. Yeah, there are companies that are available that are used to essentially establish and, and get the, the HR and payment um, so that you've got the back office support for being able to uh, hire and pay employees and do onboarding. I'm happy to, uh, I honestly, I can't remember the name of. Well, there's ADP and there are some other companies that, that, that could help to do the payroll for, for those, those. So uh, yes or no? Yes. Yes, absolutely. Yes. Okay, uh, absolutely, yeah. yes. I mean, this goes back to, to, to the kind of like the, you know, do you have to do it quick and dirty and you just come into the US and you don't actually don't follow the rules. I mean, yeah. I always tell, tell startup companies, you know, maybe by the first employee, you're still testing the waters. Keep the, keep the person there for a few months before you, you trip over the 180 day rules. And then you start thinking about, you know, what you actually need to put in place. But if you have two employees, I, I, yeah, I think it's time for you to get serious about this. Okay. Um, we need to make sure that Frank gets some airtime, by the way. <laughs> So, um, is it more difficult in your experience to find a company and then expand to Germany? Or Delaware. Uh, Delaware, Delaware, in this case, huh? Or vice versa? Vice versa. Uh, okay. Any? This, in this case, we're going to uh, expand to Delaware or vice versa. So, meaning open in another state and then move and then to moving Delaware? Or uh, it's one of those, it's just cheaper and easier to do it out of the gate in Delaware. It's, it's really, and to be clear, and maybe I was going fast in the earlier remarks, where you're formed for a registration purposes, where I keep saying Delaware, is different than I want my home office in New York City or San Francisco. So it's the home for the corporation. People typically, typically go to Delaware. Delaware makes an industry out of supporting corporations. It's predictable for a lot of reasons. Other states are perfectly fine, but they're just not as routine, and so it can slow things down. As they say, even when you're hunting money, you know, anything that's not, ab not in the ordinary, people get nervous, so it's just Delaware C Corp. But, um, so the idea of registering a corporation, if you think you're going to go to multiple states, just go register in Delaware. Otherwise, you can do a California corporation, and you can reconstitute in Delaware later if you need to. Uh, it's possible. But the typical thing, like a San Francisco, I want to come to the States, I'm going to start in California, but I'm going to expand all over, form a Delaware C Corp, register to do business in California, maybe start hiring your employees in California, and then you'll be off and running to whatever other places you might want to expand to going forward. It's interesting. I just thought for Swiss people this might be more common, right? So we're kind of used to being registered in one Swiss place that has good tax laws and just do the job somewhere else. I'm actually still driving around with my Swiss number plate in Berlin. So uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> totally works, totally works. Just go where the taxes are friendly. Um, how high should my expected US revenue be to justify a market entry? And then how much money do I need to save to kind of pay you guys? That's, I mean, tying in. It's do you want to just, touch that? Yeah, or? I mean, I, I think uh, an entry to the market, you, I don't think you need uh, significant revenues. I think you need to look at you know, your projections, what you expect in revenue. In so what time frame? When you uh, say expectation, you know, I mean, I think for startups, uh, a year is a long time. So you know, you look at three to six months to a year. And then, what number should you hit to say, okay, you know, that's if, worth it? If 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 you have revenues that are in excess of 50k, that's when I think you can really start getting getting serious. Uh, I think the other question about how how high are legal, I mean, expensive we are. This is this is, I mean, actually, US is one of the low cost 
jurisdictions when it comes to compliance. It doesn't cost that much to file tax returns. You don't have to have board meetings. You don't have to. You can do everything with board resolutions. You don't need to. You, you don't need to get your audited financials. None of those things actually apply. So it's actually quite inexpensive to operate from that perspective, from an admin perspective. It's in the not US. so inexpensive to get back out, right? So, so if you're, you know, if you decide, oh, we're going to get it all in, and then we're operating, and then we're going to go back out. This, right. this, this is right. And so I think that's the reason why I would say test the market before you commit to it. Because once you're in it to liquidate an entity, to get out, it just costs you quite actually more money to, than, to, than to have gotten in. So yeah. this is really a decision. But that's true not, for the U not only for the US. It's actually true for, for all jurisdictions. Uh, and, and so yeah, uh, th th think, think clearly about it. And it goes back to the theme that we are having is make sure you, you kind of get your ducks in a row and actually have thought through all of the implications before you ultimately commit uh, to you know, setting for the US. Okay, Frank, I have a question. Is there any coincidence that the guy whose story you kind of explained has <laughs> your name? There's, there's, no, that is strictly a coincidence. Really? Okay, I wondered. Friedman came up with the name. <laughs> Frank was so, doing that before he became so a lawyer. So you obviously yes. think Frank should learn something. Yes. So that was a hint. Yes. Okay, um, as long as I, as far as I understand, I know you're Swiss. Are you based in Switzerland? Uh, no, I'm based in San Francisco. Okay, so I you're am. all based in San Francisco, or I'm not? New York. So you're in New, New York. York. Yep. Why does it make sense to have two offices in the U.S.? Is it just to serve the clients? I mean, so, local relationship, um, or is there a legal have, We have aspect? seven. Um, the firm started in Baltimore and then grew to Washington, D.C. D.C., we do a lot of regulatory <laughs> work in all areas of, of, of the government. Um, New York then opened up about 15 years ago. Um, heavy concentration um, in intellectual property um, and uh, corporate um, and just general commercial litigation. Um, and then um, the firm asked Mr. Nelson to open up San Francisco. Be a little um, entrepreneur exactly. in a law firm. Yep. Relatively inexpensive. Yeah. <laughs> uh. Yeah, always depends on perspective, right? Can I, one or earlier Absolutely. comment on the question no, no. too, not just revenue, but I see a lot of people drift in the states where they start having people here on a regular basis, or people in the states on a regular basis. Yep. That's a trigger beyond revenue. If you start having individuals, I agree with freedom and test the market, but if you find you, you've got people there for an extended period, you're in a position where you could be triggering a, a presence there is an actual number to this, what does extended presence mean, right? It's a 180-day rule. Does it apply to the U.S. too? It does. It does. So there's, there is a, uh, a, a permanent establishment, which is basically a taxable presence in, in the United States. And so if you, if you trip over that, that threshold, which is 180 days, it's actually a, a slightly more complicated formal in the U.S. It's, it's a three-year average. Oh, so oh, the way how right. you, you actually go about it, you always stay below 120 days mm -hmm. in any given year, and okay. then you will be safe. Okay. Uh, but if you trip over that, then, then yes, then you have potentially some, some tax exposure. Okay. Well, 120 days is not much um, when you look at actually doing some work. They're right, and that's um, where people will. You come over, and then it gets going, and that's the part where, hey, pause, let's make yeah. sure we're doing it the right way. The structure is right, which kind of um, gets us directly into the next question. <laughs> I suppose it's a no, but does expanding to the uh, U.S. automatically result in a visa? No. Do people get a working permission? Why not? How do you get it? There is a, uh, so none of us are employment lawyers. We have to do the l attorney disclaimer. Oh, oh, but yeah, uh, great. Thank you for that. <laughs> I was looking for this. I already missed there it. Is a, there is a visa that's available if you're a big investor, you know, if, if you're, I forget what the number is, but just coming to the States for employment purposes, you have to be sponsored. So the company that you're creating or the company that you're going to be a part of would have to, if, if employment is the means by which you're going to use to establish your status of getting a visa. Otherwise, you know, people are over on extended tourist visas, I guess. <laughs> I will say yeah. investment, as much as that too, you know, Trump speaks a lot too. There, I don't know that there's a whole lot of uh, changes in things that would be material in this, you know, in this environment and world, but uh, you don't get a visa automatically just because um, you started a company in the states. Okay, there is some things I learned about that. Um, I know you're not visa lawyers, but still, um, <laughs> they have. You guys have a special talent visa, things like that. Do you do you see that a lot? Yes, that's often done. Uh, certainly with established companies, that's one of the what easier ways. What does established ways. mean? 
Uh, you know, well, I think a company of any size can do the sponsorship, but it's more often that you have a larger company that says, I couldn't find the talent in the States, I'm bringing over, over so, or, you know. So, yeah, so there, so there are two types of visas, and that's actually how I got to the U.S., so I don't know whether I'm talented, but I got one of those Let's visas. Hope. Let's hope so. <laughs> uh, so there, there are two, two, two programs. So one is kind of like the really talented people, but by now you yeah. really have to be a Nobel Prize winner to, to get those types of visas, and they're basically in, inapplicable. To, I, I don't know anybody who came over with that type of Maybe visa. Maybe you should reconsider your uh, friends group. I know, no. I know. <laughs> uh, and then there's the so-called H-1B visa. That's yeah. kind of like, that's really a skilled labor visa. And that's kind of like where you have, a, a, you know, have an engineering degree or you're in R&D or you're, you, you're, you're a highly accomplished technician. In that's the job where you are applied, right? Correct. Not in any. In the job and you're applying. Okay. And then there's a whole process that these companies have to go through in the United States to find an equivalent okay. employee in the US and then, you know, Tech, tech companies have been very good in, in, in utilizing those, those programs, and there has been a lot of noise around Mr. Trump saying too many folks are coming into the U.S. Mm -hmm. The reality is such that, that actually, quite frankly, still lots of uh, folks uh, come in through the, through the H-1B visa. Okay, so that's also covering the next question, which is, which is a really interesting topic, right? So we considered, um, so we are a family of two founders, and, and uh, either to go to San Francisco or Berlin, and, um, and for different reasons, we chose Berlin. And what is interesting, also coming from Switzerland, where it's a nightmare to get someone employed who is not with, from the within the EU area, um, is that in Berlin, it takes you seven days to get a working permission for pretty much anyone. It's not a hassle at all. Um, I mean, yes, admittingly, it's engineers, so it's easy to, to, um, to explain why you need them. Um, but it's super easy to get to get foreign um, employees in, um, so that's something you absolutely need to reconsider. Because yeah, I I remember in Switzerland we had to file like that thick right. um, file um, twenty thousand lawyer costs each and every single time when we wanted to employ uh, a Romanian um, engineer, for example. I will say on the on uh, immigration, there's a lot of specialist firms. Like if someone needs an immigration counsel, folks like us can make a referral. So but yeah, a lot of a the immigration councils sit in boutique firms, smaller firms that just do immigration and okay. often do it by fixed fee pricing arrangements. <laughs> that sounds good. Um, so I think we, we um, answered the next question as well. Is there anything you want to add for founders and please? I think it's covered, right? Yep. Um, is there a low effort, stra low effort strategies are always the best? To enter the US for making digital products just available. Okay. So, i.e., using a German um, technology as basis and adapted. Absolutely, we we do this regularly. In fact, we just this week have done one. So, yeah, come to the states, use your existing terms. Um, obviously, English language, but use your existing terms. Um, running it through a law firm like less than a a thousand bucks, which may seem like a but you know, run it through, and it's a matter of choice of law changes. Uh, and some other kind of nuances. You may have to deal with issues where, um, you know, where disputes might be in things that no one would ever think of and hopefully never happens, but you need to think through. But the bottom line is you can use 96, 97 percent of existing terms, bring them over for what are pretty straightforward sales, assuming whoever you're selling to maybe is consumer class or otherwise. Uh, obviously, if you're going to run into situations where your customer base is going to push back or negotiate, that's where you can have people say like, hey, I really want to have someone from the U.S. on the other side as opposed to having to uh, deal with an entity that's not that cited in the U.S. That only applies if no, not one single employee is sitting on U.S. ground. Is that correct? Or? Uh, it's separate, actually. I mean, to me, I would split selling to customers versus employees. A simple way, kind of go-to-market customers, is adapt your terms. We do it routinely. Okay. Even established companies want to keep it that way because if you make a change in one, you want to keep it consistent across. And for the most part, we have fewer regulations. Our data privacy requirements are obviously far less, although certain states are starting to get active. Um, and, and general compliance requirements within the terms are less. Ours tend to be just kind of what's the commercial deal. Did that get easier over time, over the last years? Kind of, you know, the terms and conditions in the U.S. and, and the European country? Because well, I remember we once worked with Facebook, but that's eight years ago, ten years ago almost. It was a nightmare. Because when we sent it out our contract, they sent it theirs back and it was like, 
Right. Well, that's, that's the issue. That's the leverage, and that is the challenge, right? You come to the States and you can run into a company like a Facebook or Microsoft historically was more that way. But yeah. yeah, the bigger companies, or if it's a sophisticated piece of equipment or software where it's gonna go to some group uh, that's gonna wanna look at it. You know, strategically, I work with companies actually, how you present it and having the answers up front to actually try and avoid having it go to the legal department or whatever it is, there's things you can do strategically. But once you're in front, you're likely in a position at that point if you're going to Facebook where they say, no, actually, just use ours. Yep. And then you're gonna be talking to counsel and say, can I sign this or, or do I care? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, can you, hmm, can you recommend the German accelerator? I mean, there are different accelerators. I'm not sure if they, um, if the person is referring to one specific one, um, but are you working with, I mean, how do you translate that question? I have my own interpretation, but do you I, know what's meant? I mean, I know U.S. accelerators, but I don't know. I don't know a German accelerator. Okay, I mean, there are different, there are different um, accelerator institutions. But let's assume if we have a, a German-based uh, incubator or some sort of institution that helps other companies going abroad. Um, do you have good experience with that? So that the company comes with an institutionalized support, and then. Uh, works with you guys instead of just the founders come over and try and ask you for help? I mean, it's a mix. For me, I guess I'd take it into the broader accelerator community. You want to be going to people, hopefully, who have subject matter expertise in whatever your area is. Um, is it, and part of that, too, is going to people if it is an accelerator associated with companies coming to the States. I'm sure that could be valuable. Mm. Um, but I don't know or wouldn't associate a particular accelerator as... Okay. Okay. better or worse on that. And again, that no is No recommendation, no disclaimer. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we have one and a half minutes left, and I want to make sure it's your time. Okay. So um, if, you know, take, looking at all these questions that we answered and that, and that the audience posed to us and what you shared with us, what do you think are, are kind of the traps that we absolutely should avoid? Yeah, I, you know, there was a question that sort of sets up um, that was on the screen that disappeared that's similar to your question, um, is um, I, think, I think one of the biggest traps is, is entering the U.S. market without understanding the technical landscape of whatever your technology is. Um, and that's why I, I talked about you know, proactively doing searching. And, and there was a question on the screen that disappeared, um, was what's the cost of, of an IP search? Um, trademark searches, very straightforward. Um, knockout search, you're looking at $1,000. Um, when it comes to patent searching and, and, and understanding whether um, you would arguably be infringing on someone else's, someone's U.S. patents, um, those get more involved and we always hire um, a vendor to do the searching and that typically is, it varies based on the sophistication of the technology, but a few thousand dollar vendor cost, um, you know, typically with the attorney's fees and the searching, um, you hopefully would be around 5,000 all in, can go as high as 10,000 if it's complicated technology. But I can't stress enough how important it is to understand the risk of, or at least identifying the risk um, that you know, you're gonna receive a letter or worse, be sued in the US market uh, for patent infringement. Because patent infringement in the US is extremely expensive. Um, unlike Germany, um, I spent a lot of time defending patent cases in court, and um, if you could avoid that, or at least set up your defenses in advance of getting that letter or being sued, it's money well spent. Well, we for sure don't want to pee in someone else's backyard, but we might want to kick someone out of their backyard. Yep. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much for having you here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.